Hey, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Uh, it's really, thank you so much for doing this. No problem, my pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I said, I said it's an email, but it's a magazine, humor magazine, please laugh. And I will do my best. Your, yeah, they're definitely our biggest interview. <laughs> Um, um, how's it been going? Has it been, uh, you're back at school now, right? How many days a week? Three days a week. Yeah. Yeah. Has that been a relief to be able to be with other humans again? It's or, good. uh, yeah. Um, been a pretty crap year. Uh, sorry about that. It's not, I mean, not that I, it wasn't my fault, but, uh, just generally sorry. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. What do you want to talk about? Well, I guess we'll start with The Mitchells vs. The Machines, which is on Netflix now. It just came out. Uh, it's your new movie. You want to talk about that? Um, sure, yeah. So, uh, while we were working on Spider-Verse uh, at Sony Animation, uh, there was this guy, Mike Rianda, and he was working on a, a personal little movie about his family that had some you know uh, killer robots in it <laughs> and uh and he was a really creative guy and his office really reminded us of our office when we were making cloudy with a chance of meatballs and first starting out from making our first movie um and <clears throat> the studio said he could use a little help uh and he uh you know we had a, we sat down with him and watched the thing that he was working on it was just really early stages of that movie, but it was already you could tell it was really funny and sweet. It just needed a little bit of um, help, sort of landing the character emotional arcs and structure, and uh, and could use a little bit of uh, a little bit of guidance. So we uh, we decided to come on board to help him out and uh, help him produce the movie, but. Um, and so we spent almost three years working on it, uh, and, you know, not every day, but several times a week, and we'd hang out in edit sessions and writing sessions and with the cast and workshop scenes and try to get the thing to be the best it could be, and then uh, I'm really happy with how it turned out. I think it's really funny and, and really emotional and, uh, and, uh, and pretty cool. I'm proud of it. Uh, where'd you get your start in filmmaking? Uh, well, I started filmmaking uh, as a kid. I, I had, uh, it was, you know, ancient times. And uh, I had my parents had a, had a VHS camera. Uh, that was like a big camera they put on your, your uh, shoulder. And you had a secondary pack where you put the VC, VCR tape in. Uh, and I made these little, I made some little stop motion shorts and I made a little short where with my cat uh, in, a, in a city made out of cardboard called The Cat That Ate San Diego. Uh, and, but I never really thought it was something that I would do professionally, just something I was doing because I, uh, I thought it was fun. Uh, and then in college, uh, I went to Dartmouth in New Hampshire and uh, and met uh, Phil Lord, and he convinced me to take an animation class with him, and uh, and we started making student films there, and uh, and that's how we really got our start. And then our junior year of college, we were like, maybe we should try to do this for real. Move to LA after college, and we decided we made a pact that we were going to do that, and uh, and it worked out. <laughs> uh, what's a sitcom writer's room like? Oh, yeah. I said Comrade's Room, I miss it uh, in the pandemic days because you're really, it's like being in a submarine with the funniest people you can imagine. You're, uh, you get in around 9.30, but you don't really start working until 10 because they're just sort of like uh, chats about what's going on in the world and going on in their lives and then kind of get to get to work but you're you're around a big conference room and you're either breaking a story meaning like trying to figure out what the the plot beats of, of an upcoming story are going to be or you're rewriting a script that's come in 
or you've broken off in a room that's trying to like punch up and fix a script that needs uh, a little special attention. And, <clears throat> and you have to have really thick skin being in a writer's room because inevitably you'll have a script that you wrote. Like, so what will happen is that the whole room will come up with a storyline together, flesh out the beats of an outline on a whiteboard. And then you, if you're, you're assigned to that episode, you write up the official outline. And once you get sent off to script, you usually have like two weeks to write a draft of the script or maybe less sometimes, depending on how behind you are. Um, and then you bring in this draft to the room and then the room just sort of tears it apart and rewrites it together as a group. And, you know, if, you, if it's your first time and you're, you're just a, a baby staff writer on the, sh on the show, you might get really defensive and feel like, I like this is, I put this phrase in here because it's calling back to the thing that the person said in the first scene. And this is a really clever idea. And this is an allusion to this other thing. And this joke was really, is my favorite joke. And they're just like, nope, we're doing something else. And you can get your heart broken. Uh, but you have to have this attitude of, hey, whatever, do whatever you want. I got a million more brilliant ideas. Uh, I have an infinite well of awesomeness. And if you, uh, if you maintain that attitude, like you, you're not too defensive about the choices that you made and you, uh, and you are willing to roll with it, um, it can be a really interesting experience because you get all these insight from very smart, funny, interesting people. And oftentimes the thing that comes out of it uh, is better. And then sometimes you get a chance to go over that again and put your own little sprinkle of magic on top of it. But never laughed harder and more than I have being writing in a sitcom room with, you know, a dozen other really super funny people. And you're, you know, you're spending many, many, many hours stuck in a room with these people. And so they become like your family. And it's really, it's really special and you really do learn a lot of humility and what's funny and what's sort of been done a million times, what kind of joke is sort of hacky uh, and sort of you, you develop your comedy taste uh, in, in those rooms. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, do you like to make TV more movies and why? Hmm. I like them both. Um, there's certain, it's really about what, the story is best told as. Uh, for example, I wrote this movie 10 years ago called The After Party. Uh, the, and the idea was it was a comedy murder mystery and, uh, and it was a bit, a bit of a Rashomon thing where it was a detective was trying to figure out who killed this person and it was at an after party after a high school reunion and, and they interviewed a bunch of different people and each person told a different version of the night uh, in a different sort of style that met their personality. Um, and I was going to make it a while back but then got sidetracked with some other movies and stuff. And then I finally came back around to doing it and decided to rewrite it. And, and I realized that it was each uh, person's retelling was, was very, it was very episodic. And so it didn't feel cohesive as a movie. And I thought, you know, this would be better as, you know, an eight episode series. We give each person like a moment to shine. And instead of trying to breeze through their retelling, let them tell a full and complete story. And so it felt better to be a television show. So I ended up uh, making it for Apple TV Plus, and it's going to come out later this year. Uh, and it's um, and, it, and it was a lot of fun to make as a TV show. Um, but that sort of wanted to be a TV show, and there's other things that you know we've developed as TV shows that sort of we were like, is this a TV show or is this a movie? Is this just like one story about the most interesting day in someone's life <laughs> or experience in someone's life, or is this an ongoing thing that has no end? And so that's sort of how we determine whether what, what, what should be a movie and what should be a show. But I mean, it doesn't really matter to the medium as long as you can, you're free to tell the story you want and the style and tone that you want. Yeah. Um, do you have an embarrassing story about Higmer to <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Ooh, you, yeah. 
Um, no, he'll kill me if I if I do anything too embarrassing. He's a he's a good person, uh, and uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, how do you feel watching your older work through a modern lens? And what do you think should and shouldn't be left behind in terms of comedy? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, the world is very different from when how we when we started, um, and there are certainly jokes and moments of things that feel very cringy to me now, of things that I did in the past, uh, and I'm embarrassed by. Uh, I don't want to erase them from history, but I don't. I prefer not to think about them. <laughs> um, uh, and I think, you know, we've, I know, I, I know some people feel like, oh, you can't tell jokes about this or that anymore. And I don't really feel any limitation personally. You know, I think it's always about what feels funny in the moment. And, you know, certain things don't really feel funny. <laughs> uh, and so the, you know, uh, the comedy instinct is coming from trying to make the people around you laugh and, um, and so you have to have, have an awareness of the audience and what what they think is funny and what uh, what is going to um, get a surprise out of them or feel uh, ironic or true or poignant or observed. Um, and, you know, so comedy tastes change pretty drastically through the years. But all you have to do is think about your audience and think about you know, what makes you personally laugh and what would make your friend or a person you're telling a joke to laugh. And, and that's sort of your guide as to uh, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Uh, so it doesn't feel uh, limiting to me in any way. And part of the job as a storyteller is to uh, try and show people a way that you think they should live uh, and, pr and try and uh, provide an example of um, what you think is true in the world and, and say, have something to say. Um, and so I don't want to be responsible for putting out um, messages that I, I think are destructive for society. <laughs> uh, so, you know, all, all of our movies and shows for the most part, are very positive uh, and have a sort of hopeful point of view. I think that Phil and I broadly feel like people are 51% good. I can't say that we're all good, <laughs> but I, I like to believe that we're a little bit more good than we are bad. Uh, but we all have foibles and, you know, people are selfish or greedy or, you know, not empathetic and at times, but at times you can be our best selves and, uh, and we try to make movies and shows that, that uh, inspire people to be their best selves. Um, what, if anything, can you say about the new season of Clone High? Haha, <laughs> yes, we've been working on it a lot uh, this week specifically. Um, yeah, there is going to be two new seasons of Clone High. Um, and I will say that they will be unfreezing the clones that have frozen, and, uh, and there will be some more new clones as well. That's about all I probably can say, but, uh, but uh, you know, we're bringing back you know, Will, Forte, and uh, and the whole gang. And uh, I'm dusting off my JFK voice, uh, and, uh, and we're, we're going to have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And I, I know it's in the early, you're early on, but what's it like working with that casting crew again so far? Um, you know, it's uh, it's been fun. We've... Um, uh, Erica Rivanoia, who was one of, was a staff writer on the show, you know, 18 years ago, uh, is now the showrunner. And another staff writer, Judah Miller, is uh, is working on the show as well. Uh, right now, we're just in the writing stage, and we're bringing back some artists, and we're working on some early character designs. We haven't 
recorded any episodes yet. Uh, so uh, uh, it'll be fun. And, you know, and uh, we're just starting to cast some of the new newer characters and some surprising twists. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's really early still, but um, but it's fun to, to get the band back together and, and have a bunch of fresh new faces. Um, the writing staff for the show is really young. A lot of people in their early 20s uh, and they are uh, full of interesting, uh, thoughtful ideas about uh, what a show should be uh, today. And so it's, uh, it's pretty cool. What was it like when this summer, when your version of JFK's popularity went through the roof? <laughs> it was pretty crazy. Uh, it was, uh, at first I was like, what? This is kind of weird. People keep, you know, tweeting at me to do JFK voices or videos or TikToks of JFK stuff. I was like, what is going on? And then I started looking into it and it sort of had exploded for a couple of weeks. Um, it was very funny. <laughs> uh, it was very, you know, it was, it was, it was surprising, but delightful. I think it's really interesting that, you know, that people discovered that show again, uh, and that they just did not like Abe Lincoln, but they loved JFK. And you're like, but JFK is even worse, uh, than Abe, uh, for like, privileged white guy nonsense but uh but for some reason he's just more more just open about it <laughs> and, and appealing and that may, makes him sort of uh fun uh to be a weird a weird over-the-top character so uh I, I it was a delight to see people uh uh discover the show a whole new batch of folks discovering it that was you know the first thing that we ever made on our own and uh, and still very very dear to our hearts um a lot of your a lot of your shows and movies have like really like the general concept behind it are just like very out there how do you come up with those ideas <laughs> that's a great question uh i wish i knew where the ideas really came from but i uh, i have this theory that creativity and anxiety are linked in the brain. And there's a reason why people in the Writers Guild spend the most on uh, psychologists and uh, um, mental medications than any union in America. <laughs> and, and I think this is why, is that, you know, anxiety is like, imagine you're at home, you're in bed and you hear a noise downstairs and, you're, and your anxious brain is a storyteller. It's going, it's a burglar. They broke in through this window. They're coming in to get this thing. I'm going to go downstairs with a baseball bat, but he's got a gun. This is what's going to happen. Or it's a dog. The dog just got out of the thing. And then you can make up some stories. Some of them are incredibly fanciful. Some of them are incredibly practical, but the more anxious mind is weaving the more uh, fabulous stories. Uh, and so, um, Tapping into that anxiety for positivity <laughs> is, is part of the key, is you're allowing yourself to make that what-if scenario, but not out of fear, but out of uh, delight. So you're going, well, look at that. That's odd. Well, what if this happened? And what if that happened? And it leads you down, uh, down these bizarre roads, like what if they cloned historical figures and put them in high school together? <laughs> um, um, so um, so it's fun to just sort of let yourself uh, have the exercise of um, letting your mind wander into crazy places and not shutting it down too, too early. Um, and also it's been helpful for me uh, to have a, a creative partner that I can bounce ideas off of and say like, is this crazy? Is there something here? Uh, and finding somebody that who has a similar taste and point of view as you, who can sort of act as a, uh, a sounding board and a, uh, and a partner in uh, exploring uh, is super helpful. Um, what would your version of Solo look like? 
uh it would have been different um and uh, it was um but uh but you know there's still a lot of things in there that were uh that were that were our that were ours but i uh i try not to talk too much about it because i don't want to generate a bunch of news uh but i will say that it was a really interesting experience and the cast was incredible and the crew was amazing and some of the most talented people ever uh and i was really proud of all of the sets and aliens and robots and spaceships and costumes and everything that we had made that are still the same things that are in the movie uh and uh and done a lot and the pieces that were in the movie that are still in the movie I I uh I uh still like quite a bit. Uh and then there's uh, there's a bunch of other stuff that happened. Yeah. Um how do you know what's funny for a certain age? Mm. You know uh, broadly speaking, I we never try to like make jokes or write things with a with like a target demo in mind you know i mean the difference with doing like the animated movies that are appropriate for kids is that you know you're obviously not going to say bad words um or do a bunch of dick jokes but um it's not like we calibrate like oh we need to put a joke in here for the 18 to 30 year olds or we need to put something in here for the eight to 12 year old set, or this is for the parents, or this is for the old timers. Really, it's just broadly, it's like trying to make myself laugh, trying to make Phil laugh, trying to make the people in, in our office laugh. And then the other part of it is trying to be true to who the characters are that are in the thing. So, you know, like, for example, like I've got my own touch points of who, what filmmakers I would put on my Mount Rushmore of filmmakers, but in the movie Mitchells versus Machines, Katie Mitchell, you know, who's 18, has a different batch of filmmakers that she would put on her Mount Rushmore. And so trying to be true to, the, to who that character is, you know, leads to that. And it's not about trying to like dial into any particular audience. It's just trying to either be funny, something that I think is funny. And luckily, I'm immature enough that the young people seem to uh, be amused uh, by the stuff that I think is funny. And uh, and it's a little bit baffling for people who are um, o- over 75 oftentimes because it's the pace of it is a little bit uh, quick for, for a, a, an, an older, older generation. But... Um, Mostly, I guess the answer is I'm just really immature. <laughs> um, uh, this is one of the questions, one of the two questions we ask in all of our interviews. Uh, what Love is it? your deepest, darkest secret? Um, if it was really deep and dark, I probably wouldn't tell you. So uh, I'll just say that I uh, that I killed a man in Reno just to watch him die. Um, what's your what what experience have you had with censorship that you thought was unfair? Hmm. Man, that's a pretty loaded question. Um, there's all forms of censorship censorship um i've not had any like official um you know i've not been muzzled you know i will say that sometimes there's like uh studios are sensitive to 
anything that might be offensive to the Chinese government. And so they will um, strongly suggest you take jokes or things or bits out that would hurt the chances of the movie being allowed to be played in China. And that's a form of censorship that I think is worrisome because it, uh, you know, it is discouraging artists to have the freedom to sort of talk about or joke about whatever they want. Um, you know, there have been times when, you know, there have been studios that have said, we don't think this joke is appropriate for kids. <laughs> um, even if I didn't agree, uh, and I wouldn't call that censorship, I would just call it sort of a fear, conservative-based fear. Um, you know, for example, in the Lego movie, there was a, a joke where Emmett learned too much, and so they sent him to a re-education room where they held his eyes open like Clockwork Orange and made him watch like a re-education video. Uh, we thought it was funny, but they were like, Clock of Gorge is an R-rated movie. You're doing a reference to an R-rated movie in a family film. And we're like, the kids don't know it's a reference to an R-rated movie. Only the, only the people who have seen the movie or are aware of the movie know what it is. No kid's going to look at that and go like, Mom, is that a reference to something? And can I watch it? Uh, but, uh, but it still felt like it was too risque, I guess. And so we uh, had to... Uh, we had to cut it out, but I wouldn't call that censorship. I would just call that sort of fear. Um, and I'm trying to think of other areas where I've been. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been lucky in that uh, we've been able to trick people into letting us do and say mostly <laughs> what we want to do and say. Uh, and it hasn't gone back to bite us in the butt other than obviously uh with clone high gandhi being uh, a character that got the show canceled uh because of a hunger strike in india so in that sense you know there you know we were censored but really it was just we we got canceled before the era of canceling uh was a thing um it was recently announced that you and Phil Lord would be working on a movie called Cocaine Bear with Elizabeth Banks directing. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Correct. Um, yes, it's super fun. We're going to be shooting it soon. Um, it is based on a true story where in the 80s, there was a plane, a drug smuggling plane flying uh, over the uh, southeastern United States. Uh, and the plane was going down, so they dumped a bunch of uh, duffel bags full of cocaine in the woods. Uh, and then a black bear came upon the <laughs> uh, duffel bags and uh, uh, ingested a bunch of cocaine and went crazy. And the drug dealers and the DEA all went to go find the drugs, uh, and the bear uh went on a crazy rampage. And so that part is true. And then this story is sort of a, a funny, gory thriller uh, about uh, a bear and cocaine and a mom searching for her daughter in the woods and the DEA agents and drug dealers that are searching for the cocaine and everybody getting tangled up uh, and trying to survive a crazy out of control bear. And it's funny, and it's sweet, and it's very bloody, and there's a really insane bear at the center of it. I think it should be pretty fun. Um, early in the pandemic, uh, the whole cast and crew of Last Man on Earth did the did a Zoom, and you talked about the show and how close, it, how accurate it was with 2020 and the year. Yeah, it was uh, pretty crazy. What was that like? I mean, as it was starting, uh, it was like, oh, this is a little bit too close to home. And 
And then there was a moment when early on in the pandemic, Tom Hanks came down with uh, COVID. And in the show, Tom Hanks was like the first famous person to die in the pandemic. And we were like, this is crazy, man. We were like, this is a little bit nuts. Um, it was pretty, it's pretty wild uh, seeing how much of that show sort of came true. And I wonder if people wanted to watch it during the pandemic or if it was just too close to home. Uh, but it, it really was ahead of its time, we'll say. Yeah. Um, what's your dream show to do an episode of? So of another another person's like show? Yeah. You mean to direct or write an episode of? Uh, yeah. Um, boy, that's a good question. Let me think about that for a second. Um, I'm trying to think, like, like with the shows that I've uh, enjoyed a lot this year, I, you know, I really have been enjoying uh, what we do in the shadows. Uh, that show that uh, uh, it delights and tickles me. Um, I, um, I mean, there's trying to. I'm sure I'll come up with a dozen after this is over. Uh, but um, I've also, in, I enjoyed uh, Succession, even though I didn't think I would because the characters are so all so horrible and, and everything that they care about is uh, pointless. And so like, it's shocking to me how much I like that show and how fun and engaging it is, even though everybody in it is a terrible person. Um, it would be interesting to try and work on that show because it's sort of counter to the some of my personal writing philosophies, but I, but I still really enjoy it, and so it would be interesting exercise. Um, what and it's it? a comedy, but it's shot like a drama. So that's what's crazy is that that the show is a comedy, but people don't think of it as a comedy. But it's written like a comedy. It's just shot and performed like a drama. But it's very funny. It doesn't it doesn't present as comedy. It is it presents as drama, but it's a secretly comedy uh, in in a drama package. What was it like getting an Oscar? Um, it was pretty cool. Uh, uh, it uh, was one of those things where we thought we had a good shot, but we, you never know. And uh, and it was pretty nerve wracking. Uh, and there were a lot of people who worked really hard on that movie, and um, and so there was like a lot of nervousness that we wanted to make sure that everybody got a chance to be appreciated uh, for the work that they contribute on. So it was mostly nervous and it wasn't until after we were ushered off stage that I was able to sort of even process what had just happened. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was pretty fun. You know, you don't do these things for awards and certainly don't get into comedy for awards because they don't really, tend to give comedy things awards because of snobbery. Uh, but comedy is really hard to do and underappreciated uh, in that way. But uh, I can't deny that it's pretty neat when it, when it does happen. It, uh, uh, it just felt good that uh, to feel appreciated for everybody's hard work and trying to do something new and different and interesting and that the fact that it was appreciated was really gratifying. Um, what can you say about Spider-Verse 2? <laughs> uh, 
Um, I can say that they, my, it, it is miles focused again, uh, that we go into, I mean, the first movie was called Into the Spider-Verse, but in reality, we were pretty much just in Miles' universe. And then this uh, one, we will see other universes in other art styles. And the art looks of this movie are blowing me away in a way that I can't even describe. It's, uh, it is going to make the first movie look tame by comparison. It is just jaw dropping the, the artistic and technical accomplishment of the, of the movie. It's pretty exciting. Okay, and this is our final question. It's the other one that we ask all of our, for in all of our interviews. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the deal with airline food? I mean, seriously, am I right? I'll do a quick, a tight five minute set on this if you don't mind. And that's trays that they're always they. Uh, I, I don't much care for airline food. I know I'm in the minority here. Everyone loves it, but I unlike most, think it's pretty gross. I feel like they would do better if they just bought a bunch of cheeseburgers from McDonald's and handed them out to everybody. I mean, probably cheaper for them and probably bet more enjoyed by everyone than whatever the sort of baked ziti lemon chicken nonsense that uh, gets uh, passed around, reheated and sort of poked at with a plastic fork. Not a fan. Yeah. Um, but thanks. Thanks for asking. Yeah. No, nobody ever does ask my opinion on airline food, and I'm glad someone finally had the bravery to do so. Uh, thank you so much for doing this interview. My pleasure. It was a lot of fun, and, uh, and good luck uh, with Please Laugh, and, uh, and I will do my best to do so. Yes, thank you. All right, thank Thanks. you so much. Goodbye. Have a great uh, weekend. Bye. Bye.